emanates directly or indirectly from the soil or from below the soil. And of course, our food is produced from soil. But if I go back in my own history, the first time I realized that, that soil is diverse and soils are spectacularly diverse around the globe, was when I, as a small, as a kid, I went with my parents, traveled long distances by car, going from Northern Europe in the Netherlands to the south, the extreme south of Europe, and seeing change in, in crops that were grown on different soils and the color of soil. I was, I was surprised to see red soils in, in Spain. And then I wondered, how come we don't have red soils in, in the Netherlands? And um, that sparked my interest, but I was never taught soils in school. We, we didn't have a, a subject in school about soils. And yet it's so easy to, to go out and discover soil, but you need to be taken by the hand and be introduced into this fantastic, fascinating world that is soil. So soil museums actually uh, have a unique uh, place in this. And, and I think soil should be much more in the agenda of educational programs and also in, in natural history museums that should always be a corner for soils and exp explaining the, the world that is actually below our feet and, and that is so fascinating uh, of soil. And soil museums are, are the unique place for that. And, and, and around the world, there are people taking care of that to, to, to do advocacy of soil and to introduce people to the concept of soil. And therefore, I think soil museums need to be visited. They need our support. And also we need to collaborate in this, uh, in this effort to, to enlighten people of this, this beautiful resource, which is soil. Now, we are, we are, we are going to see uh, different uh, soils in museums uh, that we highlight today. And we have three wonderful museums to show to you. We have the Emirates Soil Museum in Dubai, which is a relatively new museum. Um, that shows the, the, the soils of uh, the Emirates and, and the neighboring areas. And then we have uh, a second tour will be uh, done by the doc. In, it, it, we will fly to, the, to, to St. Petersburg in Russia, to the Dokotayev Central Soil Museum. And in Russia, we have the oldest museums in, in soil museum in the world. So that is wonderful to see the, the, the soils in the, in the museum in, in, uh, in St. Petersburg. And the third is also a relatively new museum in a hotspot for geology uh, that is in the, in the lower Pyrenees in, in, in Catalonia, in Spain. And we will guide it there uh, in the third visit. But let's go over now to uh, Mai Shalabi. She is the curator of the Emirates Soil Museum and uh, will, she will introduce us to your beautiful museum. So the floor is yours. Uh, um, uh, my. All right, I guess you can hear me. So we wait a moment and we'll start with the tour. I think you can hear me now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. All right, lovely. So hello everyone. And uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today uh, and to show you the museum. Uh, so uh, we have uh, a pre-recorded video of the museum that we're going to show you now. Um, it's a 10 minute video, so I hope, uh, I hope you find it interesting and I hope uh, you enjoy it. And I'll be around to discuss after the video if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Hello and welcome to the Emirates Soil Museum. So as you can see here, this is an introduction of the soils in the UAE. Uh, there is more diversity in the UAE than previously thought. There are 74 different types of soil or 74 soil series present across the UAE. Uh, they uh, stem from all the way up to two different orders, aridisols and antisols. So let's continue learning more about the soils in the UAE. Over here, we have uh, a display of the different tools used uh, to collect soil samples and the different measuring tools to measure things like salinity and pH and so on. Moving forward, we have our first interactive exhibition in the museum. We have here the soil texture. This represents the first property that we're going to learn about in soil. And here we have a display of clay, silt and sand. So even though there are 74 soil series in the UAE, 
75% of the soil in the UAE, texture-wise, is considered sandy soil. Now, moving forward from soil texture, we learn a little bit more about the rocks and the parent materials of soil. So, the soil mineralogy, we can see a diversity of rocks here. And of course, these rocks impact the, the minerals available in the soil. So, we have here two examples of soil profiles. One is from the porous soil, which is a hypothetical example. And we have here a soil profile from the UAE. You can see the difference that in the forest soil is much more diversified in the horizons. We have all horizons visible here in the forest soil. While we compare it to the soil in the UAE, we only have horizon C. So because the climate has been dry in the UAE for the past 6,000 years, so the main uh, factor that's been impacting the rocks here is simple weathering and erosion through wind mostly uh, and this results in the formation of horizon sea but unfortunately the other factors are not really present to help the soil mature further and to help it develop the other horizons so we find that the soil in the UAE is considered young soil it's aeolian so it's always moved by the wind it's sandy soil and we can see here that the profile in return, in turn, is not very diversified. As we go on, we see more examples on the left of the different colors of soil. Once again, a further by the minerals to help provide the, the, the other horizon of rocks and so we find that the soil, though they have different colors, they mostly have the same texture. Soil. And, and we see here in the second here, interact that the profile in return, the difference that the texture has of the water holding capacity of soil. So if you're able to see, we have here sand, silt, and clay. Of course, this is a simulation using lots of different sizes. And we have a liquid at the bottom here. Now, when we spin this, to be able to see the title once again, we find that, of course, the liquid moves much faster in the sand median speed in silt and slowest in clay. This shows us that the texture in the UAE soil, which is sandy soil, makes it difficult for the soil to store water. Now this of course has other implications on agriculture in the UAE and irrigation methods in the UAE. Now moving forward from soil texture and uh, soil mineralogy, we're looking here at a special kind of soil that was discovered for the first time in the UAE as part of the soil surveys of Abu Dhabi that were held between 2006 and 2009. Now, this is very special because this is a salt flat or a sabha, but this isn't a regular salt flat. We have here a special material called anhydrite. And anhydrite was discovered as a subsoil for the first time in the UAE, and it was added to the US soil taxonomy in 2014 edition. So this is a very important discovery. We have more information about this on our website. And this included in the soil the, uh, subgroups, increased the soil subgroups from 19 to 20. So it was so a significant this is a very important discovery. Now we, we have more that the ecosystem services of soils and boundaries due to their nature are quite different from what we traditionally think about when we talk about soil ecosystems. Services. In the case of the UAE, we find a lot of gravel or alluvium, we find a lot of hard pans and lithified or petrified horizons, and all of these actually uh, serve for construction uh, services and infrastructure uh, rather than things like carbon sequestration or water purification or water, water storage. Now, of course, this brings us to food security. So if the majority of the soil in the UAE is indeed sandy and contains these either highly saline subsurface horizons or hard pans, it poses a challenge for growing food in the UAE. However, this is still possible and growing food in the UAE has always been an innovative process. And we find that when we're looking at soil, there is still a lot of soil that is sandy through and through and even though it doesn't have much organic matter 
or an A horizon at the surface, this soil is easily worked with and we can simply add compost and biochar and different biological amendments to improve the soil fertility and allow us to grow food. Now, as you all know, soil is uh, also very important for climate change. So soil is the largest terrestrial store for carbon. Uh, and of course, maintaining the health of our soil helps us maintain or sequester more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and keep it stored underground to avoid further uh, global warming. Now, in the case that we're showing here, we're not only talking about uh, current climate change, which we will get to later, but we're also looking at soil as a store for history. So we have here the different horizons as we dig deeper into the soil that show us that the UAE indeed had different climates throughout history. It went from uh, rain or wet climates to dry climates and it, went, it had areas that were completely submerged under the sea that are now on the surface. So we find that this change of course uh, in the climate of the UAE is very, is very easily detectable through the soil. And finally, we're looking at here anthropogenic impacts uh, of climate change uh, or, or anthropogenic induced climate change, let's say. And we find here the major impact in the UAE is the salinization of the soil. Now, what's happening here when it comes to the salinization of the soil? The story really starts at the salinization of the groundwater in the UAE due to the high rate of uh, of uptake of this groundwater causing it to get further depleted and this depletion of the groundwater in turn salinizes the groundwater which in turn salinizes the soil. Uh, of course this process you know is manageable now and we understand it more and we can work with it however salinization of soils is not only happening in the UAE but it is happening across many different areas particularly particularly dry areas where the rate of uptake of groundwater is faster than the rate of replenishment of this groundwater. We find that the second major threat to soil is soil erosion, and this has been the case for over 6,000 years, as mentioned, due to the dry climate in the UAE, where wind is always moving the sand around, so creating this large impact of soil erosion. Again, this can be combated through many different ways, um, and. Uh, proper management of the soil. The final threat here we see is once again human induced and we find that here this is due to uh, landfills uh, around urban centers where unfortunately uh, some deposits in the soil are not biodegradable creating this polluted uh, layer of soil. And finally and for our last interactive exhibition here at the museum we're able to see the soil erosion that we spoke about in this lovely interactive. Here we, we see very clearly how the wind is able to move the sand around. And this is what causes the movement of the sand dunes in the desert, but is also the cause of the continuous uh, soil erosion happening in the desert. So this movement, though beautiful, it is unfortunately detrimental to the development and the maturity of soil in the UAE. We hope you've learned a lot now about the soil in the UAE. For more information, please log on to our website and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, so I guess you could hear me once again. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed the tour. Uh, I realized that uh, some of it wasn't maybe uh, super clear, but I'm here to clarify if there are any questions. So I, I found that there's a question already uh, on the chat uh, from uh, Zahur. Uh, Zahur, um, so you're asking, I'm not sure if, um, if uh, you could be unmuted, if you'd like to ask your question live. Um, or if I should read it? Well, yes, there is a question from uh, Zahur Mujed from Pakistan. 
And his question is, uh, well, he, he saw your demonstration and the three cylinders, which I find beautiful, by the way, they have sand silt clay separately. And in uh, actual study experiments, we find that sand silt and clay have huge difference in sizes. But in the demonstration, he saw that they are, they are of the same size. How can you explain that? That is the question. Thank you, Zahur. So I, I guess you're talking about the one, the simulation of the different rocks that we spun. So of course, this wasn't real sand, silt and clay. So the rocks or the pebbles used aren't, um, uh, you know, weren't very proportionate, let's say, to the reality of the differences in sizes, weren't to scale. Uh, so you're absolutely right. There's definitely much larger difference in size between them, which would mean that the difference between the water holding capacity would, would also be more apparent than it was in the uh, demonstration that we had. But yes, you're absolutely right. Good, good question. But I think it's a very valuable tool because what you see is that the water is going slower in the one than in the other and that the sand transmits. And that's the idea I think that, that for instance, children should have. So I think it's a wonderful display. And, and of course, it's, 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 it's a simulation and not, not yeah. reality. Exactly. Thank you, Stefan. I just wanted to add that I, re I realized in the video I had spun it twice. Uh, which might have not been the best idea, <laughs> but when I just put it once, then it's a little more obvious. Um, but the windblown uh, simulation is also nice. I like that too. So uh, that's also something I took uh, took away from from your uh, your tour. So, um, Mike, can you say something about the the visitor groups? So what? Uh, how many people do you receive, and and what kind of visitors come into into your museum? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, of course, uh, pre-COVID uh, was a different situation to today. Uh, so last year we received uh, 2,000 visitors, um, mostly from uh, students, uh, school students of different ages, uh, from uh, primary all the way to high school. Um, and we also receive uh, university students, of course, um, and corporates. We have a lot of programs for corporates, for uh, CSR, for outreach. Uh, where they come in, learn about soil, and uh, for our programs, we don't only uh, provide guided tours of the museum, uh, but we also um, combine them with hands-on activities, so the people that are coming can actually uh, apply some of this knowledge, whether it's uh, through some soil experiments uh, and things like that, or planting activities and tree planting to support uh, the soil and protect it from erosion and so we have a wide range of activities uh, that we host. Okay, so thank you. And, and that means that you have indoor and outdoor activities, is that right? That's absolutely right, yes. Indoors and outdoors, and right now online as well, of course. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. And, uh, and a special group are always, of course, uh, uh, yeah, small children. And, uh, and I'm always, um, well, uh, it always makes me happy to see children enlightened uh, of this subject. And they're easily uh, stimulated to think about soil. How is your experience with that? Yes, absolutely. So we're lucky here that uh, the soil is now part of the curriculum for schools. So starting uh, year two, I guess, students actually uh, begin to learn about soil at school. Uh, so we get a lot of younger students, uh, eight years and nine years old, that are starting to learn about it at school. And then all the way up to high school, of course. Um, and honestly, the students are, are, are incredible. They're curious, they're engaged, they ask amazing questions. Uh, oftentimes, I don't have the answers for them, you know, so they're really... Um, they're really bright students um, and uh, it's very nice to see that soil is becoming an interesting topic uh, for students and I got a lot of people asking about what they can do in the future for their careers, what can they study right. uh, and so on. So it's, yeah. It's okay. Thank you. And one final short question before we go over to the second museum is uh, Mohammed has a question for you uh, about if postgraduates are offered any opportunities there in the museum. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so postgraduates generally, so the museum is based within the campus of IGBA, which is the International Center for Biosala and Agriculture. So we're a research center. And of course, we host a lot of interns um, at the center, whether they're working with the museum or other departments at the center. Um, so I can, uh, I can post the website uh, link here if you're interested 
and browse through and you'll see the different opportunities. Right, thank you. Yeah, many people think of museum. Some some people, I get the impression, think of a museum as something which is old. And but museums are actually uh, often thriving with research and 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 people doing investigation. So that's a much broader concept of museum than sometimes is thought thought of. So thank you for that answer. Absolutely. And, thank uh, you, thank Stefan. You, thank you again. On for that note, I just want to mention that actually we are launching an exhibition tomorrow for World Soil Day as well. Uh, launching it online on Zoom. <laughs> so ah. if anyone's interested, you can look at our website as well for more details. Great. Well, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for, for, for noting that. Thank okay. you, Stephen. Thanks. So we we'll fly from the Emirates now to, to Russia, to St. Petersburg, and we'll have the second museum introduction by Julia Timofeva. She is researcher at the Dokachayev Central Soil Museum. And we go over to... Um, to, to her to, to guide us through this wonderful museum. Hello, we're pleased to welcome you here in the Central Soil Museum by Vasily Vasilich Takuchev, St. Petersburg, Russia. This museum is first soil institution in Russia and in the world. Our museum was founded on November 19, 1904 by Imperial Free Economic Society. The idea of museum belongs to uh, the outstanding scientist, founder of pedology, Vasily Vasilyevich Dekuchayev. Pay attention to the portrait of Dekuchayev. Different source horizons of Russian souls served as paints for this portrait. Uh, our museum is located in the center of uh, St. Petersburg on Vasilyevsky Island. The museum has uh, rich collections of monoliths which replenished England. There are more than 2,000 of monoliths in the museum, 300 of which you can see on the exhibition. A significant part of the monolith is personalized and selected by well-known scientists. The first monoliths were selected back in 20th century. In addition to Russian uh, collection of soil, the foundation holds uh, monoliths from Poland, Norway, New Zealand and Cuba and other countries. All collections is divided into two parts. The first one has a museum value and uh, is included in the Museum Fund of Russian Federation. The second scientific bioresource collection is basis for soil and environmental uh, studies that allow us to assess changes uh, in soil due to climate change and anthropogenic impact. During the migration of the years from 1908 to 1914, the whole collection of soil was brought from different areas of the far east of Russia and Siberia. Today, this collection is unique and it has both a great historical and scientific value. The museum has several halls. There are soils specified by climate zone. It starts with Arctic zones and comes all the way subtropics. The collections from Arctic regions of Russia is one of the most representative and includes, of, and includes thousands of monoliths. Also, the museum has many works of art. There are models, paintings, and diagrams. There is a series of models on um, farming systems in the hall dedicated to anthropogenically transforming soils. 
In the center of this hall, you can see the part of soil collections uh, from the Red Book of Soil of the Leningrad region, which was published in 2007. There are seven types of soil described in the book, from extinct soils to soil reference. By the way, this book translated into English. And uh, the next exposition called uh, Chagrin Skin of the Planet, and it tells about food security. So that was inspiring. Thank you, Julia. That was a, a, a nice um, introduction to your wonderful museum that has been there for quite a while already. And uh, nice to see this beautiful image of uh, Dokochayev made by soil horizon material. It's fantastic. Um, so let's go to the questions. Uh, yeah, there are qu questions in Russian, which I can't read. Um, can you read them, Julia? I, I can't hear you, Julia. Hello, everyone. Okay. And, uh, I can't read it because it's not uh, It's Ukraine. Um, I, I don't know what <laughs> what it means. <laughs> uh, okay. Good. Then, then let me ask a question to you and see if there are other questions come in in the meantime. Um, so you mentioned the starting year of your of your museum it was founded by Dokuchayev himself or by by other initiative uh, the idea was uh, from Dokuchayev of course but uh, when museum was opened the Dokuchayev uh, died and uh, the first um, director and uh, who was opened the museum uh, were um, his uh, students so uh -huh. good and you have a fascinating uh, diversity of soils in your museum. And of course, uh, Russia, Dokochayev started collecting in the Chernozem belt, I think, with soils. And, and, and that was later much expanded to all over Russia and the satellite states. What is, the, what is your principle for collecting soils? Do you still collect soils for the museum? Yes, we still collect and uh, we annually replenished our collection. Uh, we have uh, different uh, soils from our countries and other countries. For example, uh, two years ago, our colleagues go to uh, far east of Russia and uh, brought um, and uh, bought um, some uh, interesting monoliths. And now you can see it in our exhibition. And uh, of course, um, the change in between museum, it will be a great idea to show different soils for our people. And we start thinking about it with you and with our colleagues. Yes. And you have a, a wonderful range of soils in Russia, of course. And uh, can you tell something? Because I, I noted on, on the social media that, that the, the Dokochayev Museum is quite active also with student groups and, and, uh, and, and small children. Do you, can you tell us something about your educational approach to them? Uh, we have a lot of uh, programs for different, uh, uh, for different people. Um, for example, we have programs for children from four years and uh, we have programs uh, for uh, older people uh, sometimes we um, sometimes they uh, come in our museum and ask about soil about uh, their garden and uh, we speak about it uh, but uh, we have a different programs and we work with students uh, with the uh, high school and uh, we are uh, glad to see you um, each person each um, who wants to know about soil great okay so julia we have some questions uh, on the chat uh, the question from sofia is is this the first soil museum in russia yes it's the first soil institution in russia and in the world Ah, great. And uh, Svetlana from, uh, mentioned that Irkutsk, Siberia is the second oldest museum in Russia. I don't know if you can confirm that, but... Okay. And, and there's a question from Sergei Riznik, is how many monoliths are in your museum? But I think you mentioned that in the tour. Uh, it 
it was in the video and um, the exhibition you can see near uh, 300 of monoliths and we have uh, a fund which um, which we have uh, more than 2000 of monoliths from different countries and from Russia of course yes and I see that you have monoliths uh, upright and some are horizontal. Are they all prepared in the same way or are some are treated with lacquer or untreated? Can you, can you explain a bit about that? Um, uh, how we prepare monoliths, you mean? Yes, um, you treat them with, with glue. Yeah. We have unique um, uh, methods for our museum and uh, we use uh, some liquid prepare it and uh, you can see that uh, we uh, we have uh, different uh, different monoliths we uh, um, use uh, glass for protect and uh, someone monoliths are uh, open for um, for you for uh, people who want to uh, see the structure and uh, ah. well. <laughs> Oh, that's great. I get often questions in our museum of whether people can touch the monoliths. And of course, I, I, I usually say no, but it's a good idea to have a, a cuddle uh, profile somewhere or, or some things to touch because yeah, sensing and feeling a profile is also important. Okay, a very short last question from Pravin Thakur is the, what is the major soil order in, present in Russia? So, what is the most important soil in Russia? The most important soil in Russia, and I think for whole world, is uh, the Chernozem. Uh, without Chernozem, we um, it's the most soil for me. For me. Yes, exactly. That's uh, the most important. Also, in the development of uh, soil science, actually, yeah? the Chernozem was was central to that. So, okay, thank you, uh, Julia. That was sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. And it was very uh, enlightening. And uh, thank you for introducing us to your museum in St. Petersburg. Now we fly a bit to the south again, and we go to an area in Catalonia, in Spain, in the Pyrenees. And there we have uh, researcher Agnes Yados. She is from the Institute Cartographic in Geologic de Catalonia, which is an institute that, that maps and research, investigates geology and soils in the in the area of the Pyrenees, and it's a hotspot for for geology, and also for soils. And um, uh, Agnes will introduce us to the museum there. The Institute Cartographic and Geologic of Catalonia is the official Catalan mapping agency and geological survey. Despite the ICGC headquarter is in Barcelona. There is a branch in the city of Trem, located in the Prepyrenean region. In this location, we can find the interpretation center of soils of the Pyrenees. Welcome to the interpretation center of soils of the Pyrenees, a center created with the aim of promoting and disseminating knowledge of soils and their importance. One of the major activities is the elaboration and exhibition of a soil monolith collection. At the beginning of the exhibition, we have a group of monoliths collected in the TREM area. This allows us to combine visits to the center with field trips in order to describe soils in situ or do field work. TREM Basin has a Mediterranean climate with low precipitation and high temperatures. We can see here, for example, a monolith in advanced weathering stage, as we observe redness soil processes. The soils developed in this area are very rich in calcic carbonate, as we can observe in this petric calcisol. The petrocalcic horizon limits the roots development. Here we can observe some mountain soils with dark and gray colors. One of our most valuable samples is an istosol. It corresponds to an ancient pit. Thanks to the collaboration with the University Autonomous of Barcelona, the different layers of the profile have been dated with carbon-14. For example, we can see that the bottom of the monolith has more than 1,000 
300 years. We can see how the eastic horizons alternate with mineral alluvial ones formed by short episodes of high energy sedimentation. Following our visit, we can observe some soils developed on medium mountain. For example, we can find some soil formed by granite weathering. We can see also a fluvisol. This is a very young soil. Due to the constant contribution of sediment materials moved by the river, the soil processes practically haven't developed. On the last track of the visit, we can find some specific type of soils. For example, here we can see aloes, a soil formed mostly by silt sized material developed by the accumulation of dust carried by the wind. We have also a profile from a volcanic area. This soil has been developed in the lower part of the slope of an inactive volcano. Although it is developed on pyroclastic material, soil forming processes have turned it into a cambi soil. We can see also a gypsy soil, a soil where we can observe the secondary accumulation of gypsum. These soils are exclusive to arid regions. Just in this moment, we can find some monoliths in the last stage of treatment. These six samples here are already consolidated and dried and ready to exhibit. We find, for example, a technosol, a section extracted from a coal mine landfill, or a soil from a floodplain near the beach. The sandy and non structural material of the death horizons make their extraction very complicated. Speaking about soils of the Pyrenees, most of the soils we can find on the higher areas are very thin soils with less than 20 cm of depth. For this reason, we choose to elaborate a consolidated sample in a block form instead of monolith. In this way, it is possible to observe all the diverse sides of the sample. The goal is to have a collection of the main soil types of the Pyrenees and Prepyrenees. Besides, we we'll also look for some other soils that, although they aren't so common, they are useful to explain some soil forming processes or important features. The methodology for the elaboration of a soil monolith consists in two main phases extraction and consolidation. The extraction consists in the removal of a column from the soil profile without any alteration. We can use a wood box or in case of rocky soils we use our own method which we call it MAMI system. After that the sample collected is transported to the laboratory where begins the consolidation process. In this stage the sample has to be dried and fixed at the same time that the surface has to be prepared in such a way that the appearance will be similar to his natural condition. In addition of guided visits for specialists or students, we also develop educational workshops to raise awareness about the importance of soils, their functions and the need to protect them. Our visit finished here. We hope that you have enjoyed it. Well, that's great. Thank you, Agnes. That was uh, was wonderful to work with you through your museum. And if you pay attention to the slide, you see that uh, the building of the institute where the soil museum is uh, is inside. The outside is the geological map of Catalonia. It's it's a print on the, on the outside. So that's wonderful as well, and gives a nice uh, context. And um, yeah, so let's see if there are questions. Um, Yes, there is a, a question. Um, I see, it's a question about petrochalcic horizons. Yeah, well, let's take the first question from, uh, uh, which is about, uh, are these all the soils from Catalonia? Can you answer that first, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, for in this moment, we have only soils from Catalonia and from the 
Pyrenees and Pre-Pyrenees from the north part of Catalonia. Mm -hmm. And how many soil types do you distinguish on your soil map in that area? Major, major <laughs> higher level or WRB groups maybe? Uh, I don't know now. Oh, okay. My but, colleagues know, but we have, uh, it's a very diverse uh, area. We have a lot of. Yes. Do you aspire to, to collect more s different soils? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then yeah. Next, next year, for example, we hope to extract 10 more monoliths. Oh, okay. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> very good, very good. Hard work. And the question, the other question was indeed, what are the current uses of soils with petrocalcic horizon? So petrocalcic is an indurated uh, horizon with uh, calcium carbonate. Could you say something about it, Agnes? Yeah, but uh, this kind of horizons are a limitation for the roots, but it could be useful, for example, for, for, for threes that are not uh, here we have almond trees, for example, in Petric Horizons, and it's not a problem. And here in the, the area where they make some hard uh, horticulture, the use is because, uh, in fact, all the water you fill in the, in the soil, uh, it's maintained in the first uh, horizon. And that is not so bad for the agriculture if you use it in a good way. Yeah, exactly. And you, and you said in your tour that, that you have a relatively dry area. So, so a, a, limit, a, root, a root limiting layer can also be a blessing in that sense, that, that it conserves water. And yeah, because you don't lose the water. Exactly. And it also depends on the depth of the petrocalcic layer. So I'm going to another question. Um, who are the main visitors of your museum? Is asked by Natalia. Our, our main visitors are the high school students. For example, we have also visitors from the university, the some students from some master, and some other students from the schools. But uh, yeah, mostly are the high school students. Okay, good. So, uh, do you have special programs to, to <coughs> sorry, to attract people to your museums, or do they come spontaneously? No, no. We, it's not like a real museum. It's like a exhibition accessible by appointment. Yeah, and then the we work, yeah, we work uh, mostly with the high school or with the, we are in a geopark area and then we, we, we trade with him, with them, some groups also with geological groups. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> and, yeah. ah, okay. Good, and uh, there's a question from Mohammed. He asks, how, to, how do you deal with saline soil samples? And you have salinity in your area, I guess. At least yeah. you, have, you have gypsy soils and calcium soils. And so how do you deal with those soil samples? I, I, I assume it's about soil monoliths, but so how do you deal with that? Um, in the fact, uh, on destruction, we don't have any problem. We don't have any difference about this. Destruction is the same. We don't have any then for us the same then a note war then a warning of note for me is that uh, we made an inventory of our collection over 50 years prepared and the only soils that were uh, were subject to a bit of degradation are were the saline soils because the salinity affects the lacquer so you need to, to monitor them over time and and do repair in time okay as we are a very young museum yes, <laughs> exactly. this problem yet <laughs> Yeah. We'll see. Right, we will take attention. Yes. So, Mar, one more question for me is that uh, you have, uh, I saw wonderful profiles again also in your museum. And of course, you deal with mountain soils uh, a lot. And, and they, are, they tend to be stony. And, and one of the, the more difficult profiles to conserve are stony soils because every time you start cutting in the profile, you meet with a, a boulder or or rocks, or and that that creates uh, a nightmare sometimes for for soil scientists trying to 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 extract soil from a wall. But you have a, a special way for that, and I understood you you involve people that have uh, experience with paleo paleontology. So can you can you explain a bit about your mummification process? What you call it? Yeah, we have uh, we work on some colleagues from here that uh, Eureka. And they are using a expanding form. That is the this kind of material that they use in paleontology with the, the bones, do not uh, broke them. And then, yes, we make the hole, but the hole has to be 
um, bigger than normally. And then we use some carton, not, not the book, the, the wood is to, so many, so, to, you yeah, know. to restraining, it, it's not flexible. Yeah, more flexible thing. Then you, we, we use carton to limit the, the surface and then we put the foam, the expanding foam inside. And then, yeah, it takes time. There, yeah, time and work. Yeah. And muscle, because you have to pull it out of the profile and then. Yeah, and after that, in the preparation uh, for, for the exhibition, it's also very difficult because you have to, to put, when it, everything is dried and consolidated, then you have to, to put the, the, the side very, well, it, it's yeah. hard to, to... You have to conserve it, uh, yeah, to, so that it doesn't fall apart, yeah. Yeah, and your techno soil is also beautiful. Techno soils are new entries into the classification system, so really man-made soils, and and, uh, and they, they, they are important because we have more people on the planet and you have a beautiful example of a, of a mind spill. I'm really, I really envy you for that. It's, it's a beautiful <laughs> profile. So, thank you. Thank you, Agnes. So we close the third tour and I, I want to go back to the questions because there, there, are, there were some uh, additional questions that we missed in the, in the, because of time and we have a, a bit more time to answer them. So let me have a look in the list of questions. Um, quickly go through them. Um, sorry for that. Just uh, yes, there was a question for the the, the Emirate Museum, um, and I can't read the name because it's in Alexander. Alexander yes, and he says hello, um, Mike. Could you say how much square agriculture there is in the Emirates? So what is the surface in percentage or? Or kilometers, and what are the most significant agricultural plants that are grown? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, so, uh, there are honestly different statistics on this uh, to reply to this, uh, depending on what we consider or the definitions of uh, moderately suitable or highly suitable for irrigated agriculture, and so on and so forth. So, different papers have slightly different definitions. Um, the lowest statistic is that the highly suitable uh, for irrigated agriculture for crop stock trees is only 0.4% of the soil in the UAE. Um, but there are other statistics, uh, you know, with uh, sort of slightly uh, different definitions and that, that number could go up to 13% um, of land, of soil that is suitable for irrigated agriculture. Uh, so, of course, being suitable doesn't, you know, there's still a lot of work that needs to go into it, but this is talking about suitability for uh, crops. Um, and here the farms, they grow, you know, the, the typical, let's say, salad uh, vegetables, you know, tomato, cucumbers and so on, and the regular vegetables that we probably all know. But when it comes to, uh, to trees and so on, um, in different areas, of course, this kind, of, uh, this kind of agriculture is not possible due to the really hard, uh, actually, like you were talking earlier, the soils can be really, really tough. So the roots of these crops can't penetrate. So then they grow trees in those areas or forages, for example. Uh, so forages and shrubs and things like that can grow in the arid soils and the harder soils in the UAE uh, for uh, livestock, for feed, uh, not, uh, not for crops. So. I, I hope I answered your question. So I have the percentages. I don't have the square. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's a concise answer. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. And, and do, from, for me to add on that, do, does Emirates do a lot of investigation in, uh, in salinity uh, tolerant crops, for instance, that, that is adapted to drought and salinity? Absolutely. So that's really the essence of uh, the center that I work at. So it's a center specialized in saline agriculture, but of course now we also look at other challenges in desert areas. So salinity and drought and heat in particular, of course, are the three uh, main things. And so we select uh, crops that are tolerant to, to these different uh, factors, but also we breed. So if we you know, bring different breeds from abroad, then they continue breeding them in the UAE until we uh, come up with new varieties that are more adapted to the UAE circumstances. So, right. yeah. yeah, interesting. And uh, the question was also from Giuseppe, what is the age, when did you start the museum? What was the starting year? 
The museum is uh, four years old now exactly. So it was open in 2016, um, in the December, in World Soil Day 2016. The center yeah. though, ICBA has been around for 21 years now. Right. Okay, good. So um, let me see if there are more questions. Oh, there's one more. Uh, can you read it to me? Because I didn't see. Ah, yes. There is a question, and actually, it's a nice transfer to uh, the next section of uh, of and the last part of this this online event. And that's Piotr. He asks, "Is there an association of some museums?" And he says, it, "There are beautiful museums." Greeting from Krakow. Well, that's a good question because uh, well, there is no no network, no association of. Some museums, well, there is as from now, because this event is also to celebrate and to introduce to you the uh, global soil museum network that was uh, started. That, that idea came up actually, it was mentioned in the past. Uh, I gave a presentation myself on the World Congress of Soil Science in Rio in 2018, uh, calling for this, this, this network. But uh, at the time there was no follow-up and there was a paper that was uh, written uh, on the initiative of Anne Richer de Forge in, by, from INRA, in, in which many of the people involved in soil museums uh, participated to, to highlight and to document what soil museums there are in the world and where they are and what they do. And that paper, from that paper, the, the co-author started discussing saying, well, should we, should we uh, start a network? And that's actually what, what, what led to this, this online event and the start of a network where we will collaborate. So let me, let me uh, tell you a bit about why we think a soil museum network is important. Most of these soil museums, they, they were founded in different times, in different places, uh, in different organizations, and sometimes also with different purpose. Of course, the overall purpose is to highlight soils and to, to enlighten people on soil as a natural resource. But most of them, they work independently. So they, they collect their own, uh, their own samples and they present them in a way. ISRIC has been, uh, so the institution where I work for, uh, at the basis of many local soil museums, because we started collecting soils around the world and then cooperated with, with local partners who then uh, continued the work for their own location. But uh, yeah, you saw also the Dokrachayev Museum in Russia, which is, is the oldest one. So there, there is, a, 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 let's say, a puzzle or a, a, let's say a different, a, many different type of soil, local soil museums in the world. And we all find our own solutions to things like how do we collect? How do we manage collections? Uh, how do we, what is our educational approach? And there's much to, to learn and to, to, to benefit from working together and, and, and exchanging knowledge, having uh, ideas exchanged, experiences and tools. Because also do not forget, uh, we are um, uh, going into, we are in a new era where people are um, working online and even more so with the COVID crisis. Uh, and therefore, we think that museums should be findable. Uh, so museums are not on the top list of uh, tourist lists where to go to. So we need to be findable in the physical space, but also online. And I think we can exchange tools to help each other in uh, exposing our collections, our educational programs better to the, to the public. Um, also, uh, the network could uh, organize educational programs and do global awareness initiatives. We are in the era of climate change. I think that wasn't mentioned so far. And climate change is, of course, of importance to soils and how people live on and, uh, and, and, and decide on how to manage soils. And events and conferences can be organized together. Like today, we have an online conference that was organized by the Global Soil Network. Uh, collaborate on research and education. You saw that all the museums that were that presented today, they have a research component. I think that is a natural part of museums worldwide. They have a, a, not only a documentation and the education side, but also research. And that could also be uh, connected, of course, as well, so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, but enforce education and research that is already there. 
collections worldwide are, I'm sorry to say, under pressure. They always, um, they, they are always at the end line or often on the end line of funding programs and raising funds together, getting attention for the importance of collections is important also in, in, the, in the aspect of raising funds because it takes a lot of time to, to start a collection, to have an exhibition, to have a museum. And when you're short of money, then it, 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 you cannot, you have to be able to survive and you cannot live from public visits alone. So raising funds together is also an important topic. Of, uh, we also would like to have more soil museums in the world because uh, not in every place you can be informed about soils in your area, the importance of soil as a natural body, and to have more specific areas in, uh, in every country, in every region where you can go to, to be fascinated about soil is important. So we, we would like to stimulate and support uh, the maintenance, the, the construction and expansion of soil museums around the world. And then we can learn from each other. So I think there's, there's a, a potential for build to build capacity for museum staff. And um, so to exchange experiences and one uh, group can teach the other and, and learn from the interaction. We would also like to organize global expositions uh, and that we will build on a, a website, a common website for the Global Soil Museum Network, which will be a gateway to all the virtual expositions of the individual museums. Isn't that a great idea? So that you can, you can find an easy pathway and, and look at the profiles from different museums in one place. That's, that's fantastic, I think. So we will have actually a, a common place where people can go to and learn of these, all these museums. And another idea is to initiate a journal for the Global Soil Museum Network. And there are many more ideas and that will be discussed as the group grows, the core group that, that uh, steers the Global Soil Museum Network. And we, we invite you to be part of the Global Soil Museum Network if you are managing a museum, if you are a curator, if you are a co-worker of a museum or your institute hosts a soil museum. So, and we want to have the dot on the map where your soil museum is. So now we left it blank and we have registrations coming in of soil museums. And soon this, this map will expand with dots on the map of where you can go to soil museums. And if you want to register, please go to this link on, uh, where you see, on Bitly, copy the link and, uh, and, and register your museum. And then we'll, we'll get in touch with you to um, uh, how to further this and be part of the network. So we, we are looking forward to, to your registration and, um, and have more exposure of your museum. So I think we come to the end of this, uh, this event. We have exactly uh, one hour now that we've been together and, uh, and seen wonderful um, ex ex uh, 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 expositions in in different parts of the world and uh, and we'd like to have more and so we'd like to have more of these events and uh, and meet you also on the on the future platform for the global soil museum network so keep well and thank you very much for being here together and uh, thank you emily toner and julia for uh, helping to host this and you have a Okay, and for helping to host this, and also for our guides of today, Agnes, Julia, and Mai, and um, hope to be in touch in the future. Thank you all for participating. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you. Thank you so much for organizing and for hosting us. Thank you so much, everyone. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you.